Hello everybody. I hope you can hear me. <clears throat> My feedback from YouTube is telling me that you can't, um, but there's not a lot I can do about it. I can see that the audio is going in, so uh, I'm guessing that the feedback is wrong, but I'm sure somebody will send me a message if it's not right. Uh, hello. So today I wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, an article I wrote recently, actually not so recently, a whole year ago. Um, and it was published in this magazine. Let me show it to you. It was published in this magazine. And uh, can you see that? Probably not so well. It's the, um, it's the Tai Chi Union of Great Britain's magazine. And then for various reasons, a few months later, I decided to republish it to my blog. Um, and the URL for that is available in the comments below. So um, I recommend you have a look at that after having listened to this, if you're interested. Um, the, the article is um, about the Bucci system. I wanted to give people an introduction to the Bucci system as a whole, as a complete thing, so that people get what it's all about. Different people hear about different parts of it. For example, Bucci therapy, Tai Chi 37, Tai Chi Wujigong, Wuxi meditation. Those are sort of like the component parts of the entire system. Um, <clears throat> so people sort of come into it from different places and uh, don't, usually there's a bit of confusion about how those things fit together. Certainly there was for me when I first discovered it. The Bucci system was created and developed um, by Dr. Shen Hongzhen um, after many years of research. Um, he uh, developed it, basically his development of it started from when he was a young child. Um, when he was quite young, when he was less than 10, he was quite ill with a stomach illness, I believe. And... Um, he saw uh, a doctor, obviously the family doctor, and the family doctor suggested that he, um, he studies Tai Chi, or he did some kind of exercise to become stronger, but the suggestion was Tai Chi um, for that exercise. Now prior to that, he'd spent a lot of time with his grandfather, Shen Bao Tai, and um, Shen Bao Tai was a practitioner of um, a meditation system called Long Men Wushigong. Now, Long Men is um, one of the schools, one of the Taoist schools, which means Dragon Gate. <clears throat> um, and uh, Wushigong, well, those of you that know me have had explanations of what Wushigong means. Wu means five, Shi means breaths, and Gong means work. And immediately you start to think, well, is that actually Qigong? Is that the same kind of thing? Um, and the answer to that is yes and no. <laughs> um, okay. So I'm guessing that the audio has started working and hopefully it started working uh, well before the little message on my screen that's telling me that it's not working went away because um, there's a bit of a delay with these things. Um, so that's, uh, that's the sort of starting point for Dr. Shen was Long Men Wushigong. The next step then was obviously having a go at doing some Tai Chi. And Dr. Shen wanted to, um, wanted to study with a particular uh, master, a gentleman called Professor Yao Huanzi, who had become locally famous in Shanghai where, where Dr. Shen grew up. Um, and he couldn't, he wasn't allowed to. Uh, the, the doctor, Dr. Shen's doctor, Dr. Wu, his name, hang on, let me just check what his full name was, Dr. Wu Bao Yuan. He um, said that, uh, um, that Dr. Shen would need to study with him first. So Dr. Wu was one of Professor Yao's students. 
So Dr. Shen agreed and um, spent some months uh, studying very hard with Dr. Wu because he wanted to reach a certain level in order for Dr. Wu to introduce him to Professor Yao, who he really wanted to study with. Professor Yao was famous locally, by the way, because of his abilities to, um, to perform what's known as empty force, which I'll talk about in a bit, if I remember. Um, somebody send me a nudge if I forget. <clears throat> so, um, once he'd reached a certain stage in his uh, Tai Chi practice, and that certain stage, I believe, was, um, for those of you that know, was perfecting the movements that are called grasping Sparrow's tail. Once he'd achieved that and shown that he was of a certain standard, and I guess that standard was, um, was assessed by Dr. Wu, according to his own criteria, he was then allowed to be introduced to Professor, Professor Yao's class. And, um, and so he went to uh, Professor Yao's classes um, and studied with him directly. And he tells some very interesting stories about his studies with Dr. Yao, um, which I would refer you to, um, which you, you will find those uh, commentaries in the article. So if you, if you go to the article, you'll see there's some citations in there. Follow those up and you'll find that there's some online information, um, some of which is Dr. Shen's own writing, where he discusses um, some of his childhood memories. I put a, a, a nice picture up ready, actually, of Dr. Shen. So let me just flash this up for you. So there's a picture of Dr. Shen, um, which was taken in probably around about uh, 2010, I would say. Let's go back to, let's try this camera. So Professor Yao um, himself was very accomplished, as we know, uh, as we've just said. He studied with a number of uh, Tai Chi masters. Um, he, he is connected to the Yang lineage um, through a gentleman called uh, Tian Chaoling. Tian Chaoling was um, uh, a family student of the Yang style, and he um, studied and practiced alongside Yang Chen Fu. Some people say that he was Yang Chen Fu's student. Some people say that it was the other way around. Some people say that there wasn't, you know, a defined relationship between them, and that he studied with um, Yang Chen Fu's father or uncle or somebody like that. But they were very close, and there's a there's a whole backstory to that which I'm not going to go into. Um, but Professor Yao studied with with Chen Chao Ling. Um, Professor Yao also studied um, with another another lineage of Tai Chi, which is very rare, called the Nam Pai style of Tai Chi Chuan. Um, it's traced into. Uh, an area that's south of uh, Shanghai called Siming City, sorry, Siming Mountain. Um, and so some people used to call it Siming Tai Chi or Siming Star Tai Chi. Uh, and that, that, that form of Tai Chi was, um, was interesting. It was different in some ways and the same in some ways, otherwise you wouldn't necessarily call it Tai Chi. Um, but the, the difference, I suppose, was the difference that made the difference. With, with the Nam Pai style Tai Chi Chuan, uh, none of the masters had developed what we call a form, this sort of drill of flowing movements as you flow from one posture to the next. Those were developed by uh, the northern schools, the Yang and the Cheng primarily, um, but everybody that sort of stemmed from that developed their own form and actually their own style, they're sort of slightly deviated from the Yang style, but it's pretty much the same. Incidentally, I should say, I'm gonna talk about Yang style occasionally, but um, the truth is that Yang style came from Chen style. So anybody out there that's watching that's big Chen style fans, 
I apologise in advance if anything I say implies the other way around. That's nothing could be further from the truth. But um, the lineage from Yang to Chen, and then all the way back to um, to the originator back in the 13th century, uh, isn't the only line. And there is a line that goes from the Nampai style, the southern school in Siming Mountain, um, back to the same founder, the same originator. Uh, so it's an entirely valid lineage. But interestingly, was the interesting thing is that um, Professor Yao also studied Yang style, um, and he used the foundations, the foundational principles that are present in the Nanpai style, but aren't present in the Yang style. Um, within what he was doing, and it wasn't really a, uh, it wasn't really a deliberate act. It was just there in him because he had studied it. Uh, and therefore, as a result of that, he was very accomplished in Tai Chi Chuan because he had a more complete rounded knowledge uh, of what there was. So the, the thinking is that some of the knowledge had been lost through both of those lineages, but different bits of knowledge. And so by bringing them together again, um, we have a more complete rounded picture. So um, as a result of that, Dr. Shen uh, sought out a, uh, a Tai Chi master of the Southern School style as well, um, and um, became proficient in that. The, the key feature of that style is, as I said, there's no form, it's just standing postures, but those standing postures, um, certainly initially, the aim is to develop what we call semi-spontaneous movement, sort of very fast, um, unconsciously controlled uh, movements, uh, which have a very powerful martial effect. And from doing that, um, Dr. Shen found that, that this was a very, very quick way of developing what's known as empty force. Let me just switch over to uh, an image of uh, that I, I obtained online, um, which I believe was taken by a colleague of mine called Carmel. So thank you to Carmel for making that readily available to everybody online. You can see what's happening here. Well, hopefully you can see what's happening here is um, on the left side is Dr. Shen. On the right side is one of his uh, students. Um, and Dr. Shen is doing a demonstration. So he clearly asked the student to uh, attempt to um, attack him. I don't know at what level of attack, how much force was applied. But um, before the guy even touched him, um, Dr. Shen used what's known as a form of empty force that's known as folding force um, that basically takes the incoming force from your opponent and folds it back to them. And if you look at the shape of the guy that's flying through the air, um, he's, he, you can see that the force has gone in around about um, the pelvic region. So, so his, his pelvis is moving backwards first and, every, and everything is kind of folding over, but that's not why it's called folding force. There's other reasons for that. So this is just sort of one example of empty force. And really empty force is a bit of a, um, a colloquialism and it's more sort of correctly known, if you like, as Tai Chi forces. An empty force would be a group of specific Tai Chi forces, one of which is folding force. So through studying um, both Yang style and other styles, other northern styles of Tai Chi Chuan, but also this southern style from Siming Mountain, Dr. Shen was able to quickly develop um, abilities in Tai Chi forces. And he, um, in his early adulthood, went on to teach Tai Chi himself. <clears throat> but um, he also 
became very interested in uh, meditation. Initial knowledge that he'd gained on meditation from his grandfather, who tried to teach it to him, but as a young child, he didn't want to know. And uh, similarly with my son at the moment, he's, he's only very young and I, he kind of is interested, but isn't when you actually try to teach it to him. Because, you know, young children are busy and they want to do stuff. So um, you're better off going in with some physical things like Tai Chi, Tai Chi Chuan. Anyway, I digress. Um, one of the things that Dr. Shen noticed uh, with um, his fellow students, his peers, um, particularly people he was doing Tai, um, I'm going to say Tai Chi again then, uh, a, uh, a practice called Tui Shu. I don't know how you pronounce it properly in Chinese, but that's how I would pronounce it, um, which translates as pushing hands, um, which is kind of a sparring practice, but quite gentle, uh, which they would do, I believe, on a Sunday at the local park. Um, he noticed that you know the more accomplished Tui Shu practitioners um, were also accomplished meditation practitioners. And uh, so my guess is, I believe, that, that uh, noticing that m made him want to then explore those things too, to see how those play in. Um, so Dr. Shen um, went on to study with a number of masters. So listed in the article, we have a guy called Zhu Qian Chuan, who was a, a master of a um, an ancient um, Dao Yin system. I'm, I'm going to use Dao Yin first of all, because Qigong is kind of like a modern word, catch-all word, that uh, it's a modern catch-all word that, that means qi work. And, and it covers a whole range of exercises, um, a whole range of Dao Yin. So Dao Yin kind of really means exercise. And Dao Yin have existed for, or can have existed for probably thousands of years, various Dao Yins. But also some have been invented more recently. Um, and uh, there's a bit of snobbery, I, I think, out there about... Um, the more recent Dao Yins that have been invented. Um, partly because some of them are, don't have any um, theoretical basis. They don't, there's no theory. It doesn't matter whether it's um, properly scientifically developed, just that there's no uh, self-consistent model there to work to. Um, but there's also some modern ones that uh, work with traditional Chinese medicine and are consistent with that. Um, and they're probably worth considering and looking at and exploring and finding out if they work for you or not. Um, but also, you know, there's some that are thousands of years old and the Erme system is quite old, coming from Ermai Mountain, um, Erme Shan, in the Sichuan province, so sort of bordering on Tibet. Um, that system is said to be, uh, to, to have a Chan Buddhist lineage, um, but my own experience of practicing that system, I, I wonder. Um, but actually my wondering tends to take me more towards, well, actually is Chan more than, than people think that it is. So Chan is really just the, the Chinese uh, word for Zen and, and Zen Buddhism came, went to Japan from the Chan um, family if you like, or the Chan school. Again I'm digressing but um, so he studied with, with, uh, with this guy and, and learned Erme and then uh, he also studied with a guy called Lama Fahai, who was also 
very well connected in, in the Chan lineage, and he was a Chan Buddhist master, but he was also, as well as that, a um, Tantric Buddhist master. So he had, um, he followed uh, a master from the Chan lineage, uh, and also he followed a master from, um, from the uh, Tibetan Buddhist, one of the Tibetan Buddhist lineages. In fact, this, this, this um, Tibetan master uh, was both um, Kagyu, and so he, he, had, he was connected to the Kagyu lineage, but he was also connected to the Nyingma uh, lineage. Okay, so that was Lama Farhai. Dr. Shen studied with him. And through all of those studies, for many years, um, he managed to connect up the dots. He managed to find that um, certainly in some cases, bits of knowledge had been uh, either forgotten or deliberately missed out because people had considered it to be irrelevant. Um, and, uh, and some of those bits of knowledge were present in other systems. So for example, there's a lot of um, interesting knowledge and skill that comes from Tai Chi Chuan that feeds into and supports meditation. And uh, the reality is, as Dr. Shen had found, is that uh, you know, if, if you practice and study both, then they will both support each other and, and um, you'll become a much more accomplished practitioner of both. <clears throat> so, how did I come into all of this? I think it might be quite useful and interesting to briefly explain how I became, I came to discover it. <clears throat> um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because I've talked about some of that stuff in other videos, but um, at some point uh, around about just before the beginning of the noughties, I became interested. I didn't suddenly become interested, I gradually became interested um, and reached the decision in about 1999 um, that I ought to start properly learning Qigong and Tai Chi Chuan. So I sought out a teacher and um, found lots of teachers, but uh, it wasn't until 2001 that I found a teacher who was both a good teacher and actually had the knowledge that I believed I wanted to know, <laughs> I wanted to find. Um, and I think the problem, and I think this is something that you should think about if you are seeking out a teacher um, and haven't found one yet, the, 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 the litmus test really ought to be, are they actually teaching something that was that is grounded in a meaningful theory, a meaningful model? If it's not meaningful, in, in, in other words, if it doesn't explain itself, um, or if it has contradictory uh, elements to it that make you think well how can it be both that and that you know how can something be both good and bad for example or you know how can something be both in and out I'm just thinking of sort of random examples um, now for me I think one of the first Qigong systems I tried we did this exercise where we were sort of sc scooping up air and sort of pushing it into ourselves and um, you know I kind of, we were shown the exercise, but we were never really explained in much detail what we were doing. All that we were told was that we were um, trying to bring in fresh chi. Uh, but I was still unsure of what really chi is. And maybe, you know, I had this idea that nobody really knows what chi is. Um, it's just that there's this concept there and we're still trying to discover it in more detail. Uh, but after a while, you know, that became, it became clear, not a very long while, you know, a few weeks, it became very clear to me that this wasn't really doing anything. I wasn't seeing any effect from it. And you, you know, you do need to be patient with these things, but um, uh, there was no logic to, to what we were doing. Um, so in 2001, I, I came across a teacher of this system um, who was a good teacher and um, 
and he explained the theory uh, together with the implementation of that theory in bits. You know, you start off with foundational principles and work from there. Um, is that everything I'm going to say about my story? Yeah, I think so. I think I'm going to leave it at that. It wasn't until I think the beginning of 2003 that I was actually properly introduced to Dr. Shen, although I was immediately aware that this system came from Dr. Shen and was curious to meet him and study with him. Um, and so I suppose uh, by the time Dr. Shen passed away in 2011, it had been a few years uh, where I realised and appreciated that or I saw Dr. Shen as my main teacher. In the same way that Dr. Shen first studied with Dr. Wu and then um, was introduced to Dr. Yao and at some point thereafter um, he considered Dr. Uh, Professor Yao to be his main teacher. But still, Dr. Wu was his first teacher um, and therefore received a lot of respect from him. So the same applies to me. Um, so in 2003, I went along to a meditation uh, seminar with Dr. Shen, and um, that blew me away. It was uh, very profound. So it kind of like took something that had already blown me away and was very profound and did it again uh, to uh, the nth degree. So that really, I was already hooked, but that really hooked me in because I was kind of hooked to Tai Chi first of all, and I had my own um, thing going on when I was trying to figure out meditation and all of that and see how it's all connected. And I think it wasn't really until that point when I met Dr. Shen that I realized somebody else had already figured it all out um, and I really ought to be studying with them. So I did. Okay, so let's talk about the Bucci model, shall we? Um, the Bucci model then has Four components. Tai Chi 37, which is the style of Tai Chi that Dr. Shen developed from his own knowledge. Um, the, the form that, that we practice in this style um, tends to follow um, Yang style kind of forms. However, um, some of the principles that sit underneath that are in addition to um, the principles that you have in the Yang style. So it's not like it's different, it's just there's a little bit extra to it and there's a couple of tweaks. Um, and, and, and those extra bits come from the Nam Pai um, Tai Chi Chuan, which, is, um, which we wouldn't, I wouldn't really want to diminish in any way. It's very, it was a very important um, piece of knowledge and, and it's very interesting to study just that aspect of it. Uh, but also to, um, to put, place that alongside everything else so that we can really appreciate it in the round. Um, then there's Wuxi meditation, uh, which I'll talk a little bit about in a moment. And Tai Chi Wuxi Gong, which is a, a complete um, Qigong system uh, that was developed kind of from Long Men Wu Gong, but also from Tai Chi 37. So it's really um, Dr. Shen's connection of some dots between meditation and uh, between Tai Chi Chuan. But, uh, to, and again, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Uh, and also there's Bucci therapy, um, which is a, a complete system of Qigong therapy. And the key thing is all of these things are based on a self-consistent um, model of health and both uh, physical and spiritual health, um, which is also consistent with Western medicine. So it, it, adds, it adds to Western medicine rather than denies it. Um, so for me that, that was very useful and interesting because we have our own experience of Western medicine and already understand that to a large extent it works. Yeah but there's some bits missing. For example, I had eczema. I had really bad eczema on my hands. Um, and 
you know, there's, there wasn't really a lot that my doctor could do for me. I'd had it ever since I, I know, ever since I was a child, um, and really all the doctor could do was give uh, steroid, topical steroid um, ointments, which for a while made it go away whilst you put it on. Um, and th But I, I would get flare-ups, um, and eventually I decided that the steroid, I didn't want the steroids anymore, um, and they weren't working. And um, But then there's extra information here in the Bucci model that explains a lot of the stuff that was going on for me with that eczema. And um, through appropriate exercise and practice, I made it go away, or at least it went away after doing that. Um, exercise and practice. It's only an anecdotal evidence, but uh, certainly it worked for me, I believe. I suppose the first thing to think about when you want to uh, consider the Bucci model is what chi means. Chi, I translate, as many of you probably know already, as meaning stuff. Um, Dr. Shen uh, wrote an article where he basically summarised his research on qi, and he seems to have done quite a bit of research on it, um, reading sort of various ancient texts going back, you know, many, many years. So not just reading ancient texts, but reading texts spanning from the present day when he started to ancient ancient days. And, um, in, and he found that there was uh, a variety of meanings variety of specific meanings to chi, um, but kind of like a broad meaning, which I kind of translate into English as stuff. Uh, so he, he kind of found that there were specific types of chi, which we'll, I'll mention in a moment, um, and um, but they all kind of like, to, to get them to fit together into a single category that we would call chi, it seems that they are stuff just that and and that can be um that can be uh liquid it can be solid it can be gas uh it can be uh what you might call energy um various things and um perhaps the most interesting thing about it that the key thing that that dr shen drew from this was that all of this stuff carries information and it's the information that's the important thing what is that information telling us or making us do um, so yeah and uh, there's one particular type of chi that that dr shen then categorized which he called bin chi you might call it negative chi but you don't really want to say the word negative because that can um, potentially mean yin which is not the same, really. There's there's nothing bad about yin, per se. It's just a concept. Whereas bin shi kind of relates to uh, anything that makes you ill, really, I suppose, or anything that is related to illness that you don't want to have in your body. Um, and a, a healthy body, he theorised that... Uh, is basically expelled one way or another. It can be through sweat, it can be through going to the toilet, um, it can be through breathing. All of these things can rid um, bin shi from our body. And it's perfectly natural to have it. Um, it's produced and generated from various uh, processes within the body. So it's perfectly natural to go to the toilet, it's perfectly natural to breathe, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> so that's bin chi, and that's kind of like the starting point of it. But really the crux of the Bucci model is this thing called, um, which I'm going to put a picture up of, the double vicious circle, uh, which Dr. Shen developed as a model of um, both illness and health. But we will consider it today as a model of illness. It actually consists of two vicious circles. The first of those, the one at the bottom of this picture, the vicious circle of body posture, was the first of the two vicious circles that Dr. Shen discovered in his research. Um, 
And I'm just rem remembering now that uh, there's a key thing that I should tell you about Dr. Shen, and that was he was a medical doctor. Um, he was educated and trained as a med medical doctor and worked in the medical profession for most of his life. So, um, and, and um, he did medical research and this is like one of the main outputs of his medical research. He was, at the time, he was looking at, um, uh, I think it was short-sightedness where he came to the conclusion about this vicious circle of body posture. Um, and so he, the, he found there was a relationship then between um, holding a poor posture, a posture that's unnatural, um, perhaps from sitting down, perhaps these days from spending too much time looking at your phone, perhaps back then spending too much time looking down at books. Um, various, various practices that cause you to hold a posture that is what we would say unnatural. Um, so, um, what have we got there? There's, there's, three, uh, there's three examples, long-term working position, habitual poor posture, and obesity being sort of key examples. And so, for example, if you're a dentist, um, you probably spend a lot of time sitting and turning your head in a particular position. And I believe there's been some recent work on that where, um, uh, where dentists are trained to work in a, a better position. Um, where they're not turning their heads so far and therefore getting um, various illnesses, um, posture-related illnesses. Anyway, this poor posture leads to uh, tension and narrow joints, particularly um, with the spine. Uh, and we have this idea of binchi being able to be expelled from the body and therefore it needs to flow and by, by contracting and creating tension in the joints in particular, this can prevent um, the bin chi from flowing. And um, uh, and therefore it starts to build up in various parts of the body, um, maybe in organs or in joints. So you can see that there may be some sort of correlation there between uh, rheumatoid arthritis uh, and various conditions with various organs. Um, so that that was what he came up with as a result of his work on short-sightedness and then later on he did some other work and uh, and realized that there was you know that wasn't the only thing that was, wasn't the only problem there was also um, a problem related to mental stress so, um, you know, the examples we have there are relationship problems. Always one of the major things, isn't it, with uh, even these days with emotional stress. It's one of the sort of the big stress inducers. Um, also, uh, environmental problems. So, for example, if you have a very big bookshelf with no cover on it and you have all these books that are collecting dust, um, and possibly creating a very nice breeding ground for dust mites, then that's going to bring um, problems for you from an environmental sense. But also, um, and I think this is very, very uh, prominent at the moment, is sort of negative thinking patterns. For me, particularly from things like social media, where, you know, um, I have to keep myself away from Facebook as much as possible because whenever I look at it, there's so many pieces of, um, I don't know if it's fake or real, maybe it's a bit of both, but you know, so many pieces of what I would call bad news um, that, that causes worry and, and, um, and generally there's, it's, it's things that you can't do an awful lot about. Um, and there's, you know, there's ways of working around that, but we find ourselves getting into these negative thinking patterns. So that's one of them, but also at work, you know, if you're in a situation with a boss who's um, not a very good boss for one reason or another, or you've got colleagues that uh, are difficult to work with, then again, that can induce anger and frustration and um, even fear. 
we're thinking about the past, things that we've done, or we're thinking in the future about things that we think might happen and worrying about them and what we can do to prevent them from happening. And all this stuff gets you having these negative thinking patterns. I say that you sort of, your mind goes into a bit of a spin. That it, you know, all of those things together will induce emotional stress, um, which in turn actually induces further negative thinking patterns. And so it's, you, you, know, you have this vicious circle. As a result of that, then this, this creates an imbalanced nervous system because what's going on is it's activating or overactivating, should I say, the parasympathetic nervous system, your fight or flight response. Um, that is a very useful part of uh, our, um, our makeup, but it shouldn't be activa active all of the time. It should just be there to, as, an, as an alarm system, if you like. It just happens occasionally, but because of our lifestyle, um, a lot of us find ourselves with it active all of the time, so it becomes overactive, and that, that creates a, um, it's not a block in this case, it's just causing a lot of bin chi to be produced. So we, it takes us back into that excessive bin chi bubble. Um, more bin chi than, the, than our body is able to, to get rid of naturally. And again, that can then create organ dysfunction. So we have this double vicious circle because there's also a link between emotional stress and prolonged poor posture uh, and tension. And so the two tend to interact and um, exacerbate one another. So that's the double vicious circle. And, um, and, and really the, the key to um, preventing serious illness, um, which Dr. Shen found that this double vicious circle was quite uh, strongly related to a lot of different serious illnesses. Uh, the way of preventing that is to prevent yourself from getting into this vicious circle, if possible, uh, and if you do get into it, by breaking it. And actually the best approach is to break both of them. Um, but the thing is, you see, if you are in uh, a situation where you have very extreme negative thinking patterns, your, your mind is in a spin, then sitting down to meditate is gonna be really, really hard. Um, but if you did achieve meditation, then that would um, cause those thinking patterns to cease. You know, the, one of the key things, the key benefits of meditation is that your mind calms down. You know, you, you're trying to, not trying to, but you're getting it to slow down and to stop and to focus on the present, to focus on the now. And when you do think th thoughts, those thoughts are positive thoughts rather than um, negative thoughts about the past and the future. But of course, if you're in a, an extreme spin, as I was saying, then that's going to be really hard and, and it's better to approach it from the other vicious circle to at least start to flush out the bin chi that you're producing. When that happens, then you become uh, in a closer state, if you like, to meditation. You, you've started to attack the problem uh, and then it, you are more able to take yourself into a state of meditation and calm the mind down. Okay, so that's the double vicious circle. Let's think about the components of um, the Bucci system. And the first thing that I want to mention is spontaneous movement. So spontaneous movement, I think Dr. Shen discovered that from the Nam Pai Tai Chi Chuan which is, I don't want to say all about spontaneous movement, but spontaneous movement is a heavy uh, phenomenon that exists in that system um, that we at least initially try to generate. You don't actually try to generate it, but um, spontaneous movement is a response, is a natural response, um, and is uh, an indicator that we're heading along the right trajectory with it um, in terms of our self-development. But that's sort of semi-spontaneous movement because um, it, it's, it's controlled to a certain extent and, and the movements that, that you get from it are controlled. You know that there's a particular set of movements that you're going to do uh, when it happens. Um, but Dr. Shen also played with this idea of free spontaneous movement where you just allow the body 
to do its thing. Um, and uh, the result of this is uh, it, your body takes itself to places where it can start to break these obstructions, um, these blockages, and start to really flush out the bin chi. So um, that spontaneous movement in a nutshell, I guess, or at least my take on it, or the reasons for it and how it's useful. There's probably a bit more information in the article on that. But it's something that you need to be aware of that exists. And it's a kind of a core part of um, the Bucci system in some, in you know, certain ways. The first of those, as I said, is Tai Chi 37. So if you if you learn Tai Chi 37 style, um, then a part a core part of that, but not the only part of that, is uh, these standing postures that that ultimately generate semi spontaneous movements. And through that, we are able to develop Tai Chi forces abilities much quicker than if we didn't do that. Um, so that's Tai Chi 37. As I said already, it originates from Simming Mountain. Um, so it's a bit further south than uh, the rest of the styles. But the, the lineage traces its roots back to the same founder in the 13th century. Um, Big story about that, ask me another time. Then we have Wuxi meditation, um, which is meditation. Uh, and um, if you really want to know more about that, then I recommend you study it with the teacher, either with myself or another um, authorized teacher of that system. But the key thing is with that is um, that you are uh, a essentially in the first place uh, changing your mind but it's uh, um, it's not mindfulness it's a lot more than just mindfulness uh, it's a bunch of different uh, meditation techniques that that uh, cause you to uh, be more present and uh, be more compassionate and be more kind to yourself as well. I think that's about as much as I'm going to say about Wuxi meditation. Tai Chi Wuji Gong is a complete Qigong system that was, um, as I said, developed by Dr. Shen. He developed it from Long Men Wuxi Gong together with Tai Chi 37. So one of the core pieces of Tai Chi Wuji Gong is free spontaneous movement. Um, Alongside that, and equally as important, are a set of Taoians, a set of physical exercises. Those physical exercises um, are derived from some of the movements that you do in Tai Chi 37 style Tai Chi. Uh, and the, the two things, the spontaneous movement and the Taoian, support one another. You need to do both, really, in order to benefit fully from this system. Uh, and then there's the Bucci therapy. So with the Tai Chi Bucci Gong, it's very much health focused. With the Tai Chi 37, uh, there is a health focus to it, but it's also, um, it, it, it adheres to, if you like, a martial structure. You need that in order to get it to work. So it's not just a healing art, it's a martial art as well. Tai Chi Bucci Gong, it's about self-healing. It's about cleansing yourself, getting rid of bin chi, uh, and changing your lifestyle so that um, you have a, a balance in terms of bin chi. With Bucci therapy, this is where um, a therapist helps you to achieve that. So it, it comes in particularly useful for people who have already gone quite a way down the line of being stuck in this double vicious circle um, and to get them out of that quicker then we can give them some help um, so the key the key to it is um, I suppose taking control of your own health so the realization that you are responsible for your own health and therefore um, trying to find out um, what you can do to take responsibility or more responsibility. Um, 
That applies also to Tai Chi Wu Qigong, probably more so to Tai Chi Wu Qigong. But once you've had that realization and you realize that, um, you know, if you've got a condition, like for me, it was eczema. Um, if you've got a condition, then uh, getting somebody to help you start the process of getting rid of that um, speeds things up um, and in some cases uh, makes it possible where it otherwise would not have been possible. So some people can be just too Ill, Ill to start doing uh, any form of Tai Chi Qigong exercises. Um, um, but in, in most cases, you, um, if you are quite ill, you can do Tai Chi Qigong and it's really quite helpful to have the Buchi therapy alongside that to, to boost things along. Again, that's kind of like giving you a very uh, abstract and broad overview of what you're achieving with it and I would direct you to the article to find out more specifics. Is that everything I wanted to say about it? I think so. Let me just check the article. Yeah. I think in the, in the conclusions there I'm talking about why people uh, choose to study and practice aspects of the Bucci system. Um, and, you know, because it's such a complete system, uh, there can, and, and as I said before, there's different ways in, um, there can be many different reasons why you would study it. So, for example, one of, one of the, uh, uh, I suppose, big markets, if you like, for Tai Chi Chuan is um, people who've studied and practiced a martial art, an external hard martial art, as we might say, like karate or kung fu or um, any of those um, harder styles, kickboxing maybe. And um, they want to still do the Tai, they still want to do the martial art stuff. They, they like, uh, they're interested in it, I suppose is what I'm thinking. There's an intellectual interest in martial arts, but uh, there's a realization that, that, they've, um, that they've, they've, they've got to pull back a little bit from the hard um, physical excesses, if you like, of um, hard martial arts. And so there is an interest even if they don't know it yet, of getting into um, an internal martial art, which is much softer, uh, but still holds all of that cultural value that people enjoy uh, from martial arts. I think that's where I'm trying to get to with that. So for example, um, an acquaintance of mine uh, was talking to me and she was talking to me about her husband who used to do Kung Fu. Um, and now he's turned into a bit of couch potato because he can't do Kung Fu anymore because it's just too hard for him. Um, and she's trying to get him to do exercise classes. And I said, well, you know, why don't you get him to do Tai Chi Chuan? Um, and uh, I suppose, you know, there's people who like to do exercise classes and there's people who like to do martial arts. And there's a reason why those people that do martial arts don't do exercise classes. Um, and I think it is that sort of intellectual and cultural stimulation that you get from it. Uh, so that's kind of what, what my explanation to her was. Um, so hopefully I might see her husband one day at one of my classes or a colleague's class. With Taiji Wujigung, people tend to come into that because um, maybe they've had a referral from their doctor or something where they're saying, why don't you go and uh, learn Tai Chi or why don't you go and learn Qigong? Um, and because I've heard good, uh, good reports about it, see if it will help you with X ailment, whatever that is. So usually you, um, these people are in a situation where, you know, it's a, it's a mild illness, but nevertheless, it's an illness and they've been visiting their doctor, uh, over a long period of time. So it's a chronic illness and, um, they've kind of like reached the end of all of their options in, in terms of. Uh, conventional medication or treatments 
and then the doctor will suggest well why don't you try doing this or that you know yoga or qigong or tai chi and and generally people fall into tai chi or qigong um, in terms of ah this is the thing that's going to work for me when they're coming from that angle that perspective um, with the wuxi meditation that's an interesting one i tend to get most people um are, I tend to find that most people are interested in that after they've studied Tai Chi Wuji Gong or Tai Chi 37 for a while. But actually I think there's uh, a lot of people out there who would uh, benefit and enjoy, uh, benefit from and enjoy Wuxi meditation, um, but just don't realize it. And they wouldn't think to start learning Tai Chi Chuan or start learning Qigong of some form. Um, so, you know, I'm interested to find, figure out ways of reaching those people because I think they would really benefit. And those people are people who have, um, well, as I said before, people who are going through spiritual awakening. And um, I, I say that with some, tr with some caution because it seems to mean different things to different people. And really what I mean by that is that, um, you know, you kind of reach a point in your life where y you you realize that uh, that what you're doing it's not so much it has no meaning it it's just not really fitting in with what your real values what's really important to you in life and there's something inside you that's screaming at you to change to change what you're doing and and so um following a path stemming from wuxi meditation can be really supportive and helpful in that So I think I'm going to leave it at that, actually. I've talked, to, talked now for about an hour, and um, hopefully you've all found it very interesting. Um, do let me know one way or the other. Um, I plan to come back again with another one of these chats, um, possibly to drill down on specific conditions. So my, the first one I'd like to talk about is eczema, so uh, keep an eye out for that. Um, because there is, um, you know, there is a, a really strong link between uh, between mental stress and between poor body posture and um, the symptoms of eczema. And although the process isn't fast, it um, if you stick at it and follow the system, follow the Bucci system, then um, certainly in my experience, it will, you will be able to um, make it go away. I think the thing I would put it is, you know, you reach a stage with eczema and other chronic conditions where you accept that you have it, you accept that it's there and, and you start figuring out how to live with it. Um, and I think part of that process then is discovering something like Tai Chi Wuji Gong where you then begin to learn how to live without it, uh, which is where I've got to. So my hands are completely clear of eczema now, but they used to be in an awful condition 10 years ago or so. So I think the next, you know, my next video is gonna be about eczema. Um, there may be other videos following that about other conditions of a similar nature. So uh, thank you all for listening. Um, do surf up the, uh, the article and read that if you're interested. Um, and do feel free to get in touch with me if you're interested in finding out more. Uh, I look forward to seeing you all soon. Bye for now.